So we now understand on how many neurons will you have in your input layer. And we understand that the weights are randomly initialized. And all of these are connected to the next layer. And within this neuron, you will have two um, categories. One is your integration function, which is summation. And another is your activation function. Finally, you get an output. For every row, you get the predicted value. And when you compare it with the actual value, you get loss. When you combine all the losses, you get cost. The algorithm which is used to minimize the loss is called as gradient descent algorithm, in which we spoke about batch gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent, mini batch stochastic gradient descent. And what is iteration? What is epoch? We understood them. Now let's proceed further. Okay. Scalar means a single number. Vector means a collection of numbers. Matrix is two-dimensional representation of numbers like this. Okay. Vector is nothing but collection of numbers. Scalar means a single number, whatever be that single number. This is a biological neuron. And if you look at these two, they look more or less the same. Like you have all these inputs. Right? They are connected. And then finally you get an output. Okay. I'll skip this biological part. In the good old days, people came up with a specific formula to update the weights. Then different people like uh, Windrow, uh, yeah, Windrow Hoff came up with another improved version of the formula. And today we have something proposed by Rosenblatt, which we are currently using in the industry. Okay. So this is a formula that we would be using. When you update the weights, new weights is equal to old weights plus eta value, which is also called as learning rate and which is represented using this symbol. So you have eta value or learning rate value and you multiply it with the error. Error is nothing but actual value minus predicted value into your inputs. And this eta value or learning rate ranges from 0 to 1. If you have an error function like this, or a loss function or cost function like this, and if your weights are randomly initialized here, if the learning rate value is very high, it might overshoot like this. And you might go and land here as opposed to getting to the minima here. As opposed to getting to the minimum loss function, it might overshoot. However, if you choose eta value, which is a very low value, very, very close to zero, then it might take infinitely more number of steps to reach the minima. So after some time, it might only be here after probably two, two days, three days of running your algorithm, you might still be stuck here. That means you might not even be able to proceed further. And prematurely, your algorithm will stop. Okay. If you say run 1000 iterations, means update the weights 1000 times. 
So thousand times it will minimize. If you say run ten thousand iterations, ten thousand times it will minimize. If you say ten thousand iterations and ten uh, epochs, right? That means ten thousand times update the weights. Ten times do that, right? So even uh, even after running these many um, iterations and epochs, you might not reach the minima at all. If you have eta value which is very very small, meaning very small steps you take to update. If eta value is very large, you take the large steps, and that means you might miss out the minima. Let us talk about perceptron algorithm. Perceptron algorithm. And say you have four points, four data points. And you have red class and a blue class. Red class means z equal to one. Blue class means z equal to zero. So let's create that data set here. In this, say we have an output variable and say we have two inputs, x1 and x2. Okay. X1 and X2. And you have four data points. One, two, three. And let me do fourth one also. Uh, let's call this as the first data point, which has inputs what? Minus one. X1 is minus one. X2 happens to be again minus one. Okay, this is minus one. Minus one here, which is X2. Okay. And what is output? Z equal to zero or blue class. I'll write blue. Okay. And this assume is our second data point wherein you have minus one as X1 and X2 is 1 by 2 or 0.5. And this is also blue class. Okay. Then we have two other data points. Let me call this as a thir third data point wherein we have x1 as 0.5 and you have x2 as 1. And this happens to be red class. Then we have two other data points here, or uh, uh, one data point which has uh, two inputs. X1 is 1, and X2 happens to be 1 by 2.5. And this also happens to be red class. Okay, this is the data that we have. A toy example is what we are trying to understand by taking just four data points. How are the weights initialized in neural network randomly? So there we go. I'm not sure whether I can take a screenshot of this portion. And can I paste it? No. Okay, fine. Leave it. Okay. So here, the weights are randomly initialized. And randomly, the weights are initialized as 0 and 1. And the eta value is chosen as 1 by 3. Eta value is also called as learning rate. And it ranges from 0 to 1. If you at any given point of time feel that there are far too many things in this, how do I remember? The only way to remember is revisiting the concepts again and again. And the easiest way is to read your mind map on a daily basis. Simple. That is 
the only way out for you all to remember all these concepts. Okay. And when you look at this, with these weights, say your classifier is this line. Anything which falls above belongs to the red class. Anything which falls below belongs to blue class. So since this point is falling below, it will be predicted as blue. Actually, also it is blue. And if you look at this point, it is, since it is above the line, it will be predicted as red and actually also it is red. And this point also, since it is falling above the line, it would be predicted as red and actually also it is red. However, this point would be misclassified. Any point above this would be red, but this is blue. So this is misclassified. Misclassified. And this will give you error. So what do we need to do for this? Whenever you have loss or error, you back propagate and update the weights. So we need to now update the weights. And what is the formula to update the weights? Formula is New weights is equal to old weights plus eta value into error into input. Old weights, right? So let's update this, this weight first. So this weight, when we when you try to update, new weight is equal to old weight, which is 0 plus eta value is 1 by 3 into you have actual value minus predicted value. Actually, this is what z equal to 0. Actual, actual value is. But since it is falling above, it will be predicted as z equal to 1. So the actual value or the true value, true value or actual value is 0. And then the predicted value is 1. When you subtract these two, you get minus 1 and that happens to be this. Into what is the input pertaining to this? If you look at this data point, which is the second data point, x1 is minus 1. So into minus 1, when you solve that, you get 1 by 3. So the new weight is 1 by 3. Now let's also look at this one here. We need to update this also. So old weight, sorry, new weight is equal to old weight, which is 1 plus eta value, which is 1 by 3 into Actual value minus predicted value, which is 0 minus 1, and you get minus 1 into it is 1 by 2, which is input. So you get 5 by 6. That's another weight. So now, when you initialize randomly these for the weights, now we have these as the weights. Now the classifier slightly changes with the new set of weights. With 1 by 3 and 5 by 6, the classifier has become slightly better. However, this point would still be misclassified. Any value above the line would be red. Any value below the line would be blue. But this is above the line, so it is still blue. Now, in order to update the weights, because this is incorrectly classified, we need to once again update the weights. And new weights is equal to old weights plus eta value into error into input. So let's update for this portion, 1 by 3. So new weights is equal to old weights, which is 1 by 3, plus eta value, which is 1 by 3, into. Actually, this is z equal to 0. But the classified value is 1. 0 minus 1 will give you minus 1 into your input. The second value is misclassified. Input is minus 1. So you get 2 by 3. Now let us update for the next weight also, which is 5 by 6. So new weight equal to old weight 
which is 5 by 6 plus eta value into actual value minus predicted value. Actual minus predicted would give you minus 1 into the input is 1 by 2. And you get 2 by 3. So now the weights are updated from this to this using this formula. With these new set of weights, when you look at your classifier, now it is giving you all correct results. The data points which fall above the line belong to red class and the data points which fall below the line belong to blue class. Okay. So, you have the integration function and you will have the activation function within a neuron. Now, this perceptron algorithm that we have just spoken about will have input layer and it will have an output layer. That's it. So, you take all of these and supply it to this. One will be bias. Bias will always have an input one. And then you have your other inputs, x1, x2, x3. And then within this, you will have integration function and activation function. And then finally, you will get an output. Okay. So when it comes to perceptron, number one, there are no hidden layers. Number two, you have a single neuron in your output. Number three, this can handle only linearly separable problems. It can only capture linear patterns. However, we know for a fact that majority of the data that we deal with in real world would be nonlinear in fashion. The moment you have nonlinear data, there are two ways of capturing the nonlinear patterns. One is you change your integration function. So within a neuron, what would you have? Integration component and activation component. These are the two components which you will find in any of the neurons. So you have the integration component and you have the activation component. When it comes to integration component, the basic integration component is summation. By changing this integration function, from summation to some other function, you can handle the nonlinear patterns. Another way of handling nonlinear patterns is by looking at not just one perceptron, but multiple perceptrons, and that is called as multi layered perceptron or artificial neural network. Or this is also called as a fully connected network. Or this is also called as dense network. If you have data like this, is it linearly separable? By drawing a single line, you can say. However, if you have data like this, Then using a single line, can you segregate? No, but using multiple lines, I can segregate pink from blue. The moment I have, multi if you have one line, it is perceptron. If I have multiple lines, it is multi-layered perceptron, simple. Okay, which also has multiple names. So 
So when it comes to changing your integration functions from summation to something else to capture the nonlinear patterns, then people use quadratic functions. If you have a curve like this, then is it linear? No, it is polynomial with two degrees. This is polynomial with two degrees. Because you have one bend, it is called as polynomial with two degrees. If you have like this, how many bends do we have? Two. So it is called as polynomial with three degrees. Polynomial with two degrees is given a special name called as quadratic. Quadratic relationship, it's like that. If you want to capture quadratic, you use this x. Usually it is what? Y is equal to B plus M, uh, W1, X1 in that way. But here what you do is, you say, w1 x1 square so for example b plus w1 x1 square plus w2 x2 square in that way. by taking square you're capturing the quadratic pattern there might be spherical pattern also your data might be like this right your data might be like this also So in spherical format, if the data is in spherical format, what you do is you say x minus w whole squared. So you write it as y is equal to b plus x1 minus w1 whole square plus x2 minus w2 whole square plus x3 minus w3 whole square, so on and so forth. And this will help you capture spherical pattern. How many such experiments will you perform? And usually you'll have multiple variables, multiple inputs. And when you have multiple inputs, you'll not be able to figure out what kind of pattern your underlying data actually follows. When you cannot find out what is the underlying pattern which your data follows, then it doesn't make sense to go about experimenting all of these. Instead, okay, you can go with something called as multi-layered perceptron in which you'll have your input layer, hidden layer and output layer. Okay. Say for example, you're taking four, which is a digit. Okay. And if you're supplying it to the hidden layer, that hidden layer will capture different patterns like this. The patterns which are captured by your hidden layers is actually hidden. It is black box. Okay, it is hidden, it's black box. Hence, your neural network algorithms are also called as black box techniques. Why? Because you will have no interpretation for the weights. Okay. So, you have your input, you're supplying it to the first hidden layer. Initial set of hidden layers capture what? High level details or low level details? Low level details. Wonderful. Then whatever you learned, your algorithm learned here as part of first hidden layer, it will pass on those to the second hidden layer. Second hidden layer would capture probably mid level features. Then whatever mid-level features your algorithm captures here, hidden layer, those will be passed on to the third hidden layer. And here you'll capture the high-level patterns. And finally, you will have an output layer, which should give you the outputs. If I have a data set, wherein say output variable is continuous variable. Say you want to predict salaries of people or electricity consumption, whatever, some numbers, sales, etc. And you have three inputs. 
if you have three inputs, how many neurons will we have in the input layer? Three neurons plus one bias. One bias plus you'll have three neurons in your input layer. So the number of neurons in your input layer will be fixed. They won't change. Now the question is, how many hidden layers do I need to have? You can have unlimited hidden layers. You can have how many ever you want. I can have either one hidden layer or two or three or four or five. So if I can keep changing the values of hidden layers for experimentation purpose, then can I call the, call the number of hidden layers as a hyperparameter? Yes. So number of hidden layers would be called as your hyperparameter. So let's say I'm going to create two hidden layers. It's my wish on how many hidden layers I want to create. Number of neurons that I'm going to have in each of the hidden layer is also hyperparameter. Okay. The number of neurons that you're going to have in each of the hidden layers would also be called as a hyperparameter. So you can have as many neurons as possible. I can have either three or four or five or 100 or 200, my wish. It's hyperparameter. If you keep you adding more and more hidden neurons, more and more hidden layers, what will happen is your model accuracy will increase but your model also might overfit. And it will be time consuming. If you keep on adding more and more hidden layers, more and more neurons in the hidden layers, it would be time consuming. It will take huge amount of time. Okay. All right. Then every neuron, except for your input layer, Friends, except for your input layer, every neuron will have two components. Every neuron will have integration component and activation component. Every neuron will have integration component and activation component. And you'll have connections. If at all every neuron is connected to every other neuron, okay, if you connect every neuron, to every other neuron in the forward layer like this, then it is called as what network? Dense network. Dense. It's really dense out there because there are far too many connections, like right? Or fully connected network. Or dense network. Or multi-layered perceptron. Or artificial neural network. All are different names provided to the same network architecture. Then, since your output variable is numeric in nature, you will have a single neuron. And this will have again two components, integration, activation. Finally, you get an output. So if your output is continuous, how many neurons will you have in your output layer? One. Okay. If your output variable is categorical, and if it has two classes, two categories, then how many neurons will you have? Only one or two, but usually one. Why? Because say you're predicting whether a customer will churn or not churn, assume. Output variable is whether uh, or an employee, will that employee a treat or not a treat? It's a two class classification problem. In this two class classification problem, <clears throat> If the output says that there is 88% probability 
that the custom that that an employee would treat then what is the probability that employee will not treat so even if you do not have the second neuron you know that the answer would be 12% Hence, if you have single neuron also, it will do the trick for you. And then, what is the loss function that we do, that we are going to have? Loss function or cost function? Mean squared error. Here, what will you have? Binary cross entropy. Absolutely. Loss function would be binary cross entropy what if your output variable is categorical and if you have more than two classes if you have a 10 class problem wherein given an input you need to classify whether it is digit 0 or 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 or what is that number? How many classes do you have here? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 10 classes. It's a 10 class classification problem. When you have multi-class classification problem and say you have 10 different classes, then in the output layer, how many neurons should you have? 10. Yeah, you can also have 9, but say 10. Usually you will have n. n means if you have 10, you will have 10. If you have 20, you will have 20. If you have 3, you will have 3 in that. And then you have something called as categorical cross entropy, which will be used as a loss function or a cost function. Okay. Okay. I wish to talk about two or three additional things as well here. All right. Hmm. Activation functions. Now let me talk about that. Of course, we'll have certain slides put into activation functions. Maybe. This is a loss function or cost function. And the loss function or cost function is used only and only to What do you do with the loss function or cost function? You want to minimize it. When you have the term such as minimize or maximize, what is it called as? Optimization in the mind map. In the very first phase, understanding business problem. When you expand that on mind map, you'll have objectives and constraints. You have to write these two using terms such as minimize, maximize, which are? Data optimization terms, it's clearly written. Read your mind map daily, please. Friends, you'll get a job if you read your mind map daily. If not, you won't get. It is as simple as that. That means you're not even well prepared with the terms. Okay. So optimization purpose. For optimization purpose, we use loss function or cost function. But how do I measure how good or bad the model is? Using some error functions or accuracy functions. How do you calculate the error when it comes to output variable continuous? Same, you can use either mean squared error 
or root mean squared error, etc., or mean percentage. When it comes to binary cross entropy, when you have a two class classification problem, how do you measure? Using accuracy, which is obtained using confusion matrix. Am I still there? Are you guys able to hear me? Friends, please confirm. Okay, wonderful. Right? Confusion matrix or cross table or contingency table. All mean the same. Okay. So, you know, error functions, loss functions, cost functions are used for optimization purpose to check how good or bad your model is. We have accuracy function or um, uh, error function and you know about output layer neurons. Now, let me take Srikant's question. He has his hand raised. Yes, Srikant. Sir, if Y being continuous, so always do we use like a MSE or can we use a RMSE or like MAP? Well, oh, you can use RMSE or mean percentage error. You can use any of those. Okay. Sir, if it is for like multiple categorical variables, mm -hmm. so what kind of matrix will use like a... Same cross table or confusion matrix or contingency table. Okay. Use the same things. Okay, so thank you. Yeah, okay, sure. Okay. Now, activation function. Function. When you have output variable which is numeric, continuous or count for that case, we use linear activation function, meaning don't do anything. What your linear activation function does is, friends, I'm talking about the activation function and output layer. Okay, I'm talking about output layer. When you use linear activation function, whatever value you get here in integration, you take the same and pass it to your activation. Whatever integration function you have that will give you a value, you take the same value and give it to your activation. So that's your linear activation function. When it comes to binary cross entropy, We use something called as sigmoid or tan h activation function. Tan h stands for hyperbolic tangent. We'll talk more about it. For now, just remember. And when you have categorical data or multiple categories, we use something called as soft max. softmax. The only job of softmax activation function is that if you have 10 class problem, you'll have 10 neurons, right? In the output, you'll have 10 neurons. All of these 10 will give you some numbers as output. But when you add all of those numbers, you'll not get one. 
And why do you think adding all these numbers should give you one? What is the probabilities of all the classes when you add, you'll get one. But here you won't get one. Okay, you are not going to get one when you take the outputs of all the uh, neurons and when you add them. Hence, we apply something called a softmax, which is going to normalize the data such that when you add all the outputs of all the neurons, it will be equivalent to one. And softmax has only that role to play. And these activation functions will capture non-linear patterns. Linear will not capture. Linear will capture only linear pattern. Okay. Now, all these things that I've just spoken about, you would have it in this spreadsheet. Let me open this. Okay. So please look at this. Um, spend some time on this. It is very, very important for you all to understand things. is what I will uh, I'll leave that open you know now activation functions identity function would take the data as is and give you the same output so whatever is your integration function the same will go to your activation the same will come out as an output identity function step function we have already discussed then you have something called as ramp function One, say you have two inputs, x1, x2. So what will happen to your integration? V into 1 plus W1 into x1 plus W2 into x2. Can you switch that on? Sorry, I thought you guys... Uh, so sorry, uh, we were just you know, switching on this. So I forgot about this. My bad. Okay. So this is your identity function or linear function. So here, when you do your integration, B plus W1 X1 plus W2 X2. Okay, this is what you get. And whatever is the value, if that value is less than zero, the final output will be zero. If that value is greater than 1, say 1.8, output will be 1. If this value is 0.8, the output will be 0.8 only. So if the value is in between 0 and 1, whatever be that value, that will only be your output. If you get 0 0.6, 0 0.6 only will be the output in that case. Okay. And then you have something called as sigmoid function. When it comes to sigmoid function, whatever be the integration value, whatever be the integration value, integration values can range from say minus infinity to plus infinity, whatever be the values, when you supply to the sigmoid activation function, the outputs will fall in the range of 0 to 1, like probability values. Probability values range from 0 to 1. So if you get the output as 0.7, that means there's 70% probability that probably customer will churn or employee will add treat, etc. So whatever be the inputs that are supplied to the sigmoid function, sigmoid function is going to squash the values into the range of 0 to 1.
then you have something called as tan h when it comes to tan h i'm only talking about activation functions within your <coughs> output layer okay. but but then um, the other activation functions okay let me refrain from using this all these activation functions can be either are they used in output layer or hidden layer so okay. tan h will take your values and then it is going to squash the values into the range of minus 1 to plus 1 when it comes to hyperbolic tangent sigmoid is going to squash the values into the range of 0 to 1 so when you have a two class classification problem you can either have sigmoid or tanf usually people prefer uh, sigmoid then we have something called as relu and you have something called as leaky relu and elu all these are called as relu families these are called as smoothening activation functions smooth activation functions these are called as relu family and relu stands for rectified linear unit and people experimented with different neurons in the hidden layers sorry different uh, activation functions in the hidden layers and they figured out that and they figured out that when people used relu activation functions in the hidden layers the results were very good in comparison to other activation functions and hence the world today uses relu and relu family of activation functions within the hidden layers because it is giving the best results in relu activation function what do you do is if you have like this and b x1 w1 x2 w2 and you want integration integration is b into 1 b plus w1 x1 plus w2 x2 you get integration function you take that and supply it to your activation function so when you take the integration value if this value is going to be less than 0 less than 0 then output will be always 0 because it will take maximum of these if i have maximum of 0 comma any negative value minus 0 0.1 or minus 0 0.2 any negative value maximum of these two will always be 0 and if this value is a positive value say you got 70 as an output so again maximum of 0 comma 70 would be 70 so the output will be 70 and if you have a kink or cusp whatever that sharp point the derivation over there will be always zero the derivative at that sharp point will be zero if you want to minimize the loss right your curve should be smooth if there is going to be that sudden change at that sharp point, if it falls, then derivation there will be zero. Means it won't minimize further. So that's the issue. Hence, people came up with something called as ELU function, wherein you have that smooth finish there instead of a sharp bend. Leaky ReLU is because, you know, for any negative value that you get, ReLU function will um, make that value zero. But sometimes negative values might make sense. So leaky relu gives some weightage to the negative values. That is some 10% weightage. 1% weightage. 
then you have max out, etc. Then in that way, there are a lot of activation functions. Mm -hmm. I don't intend to do the data science training anyways. Let me go here and try to explain. Just this explanation bit, friends. Post that we'll take a break. And uh, once we are back from the break, probably we'll get into the practical uh, discussion. Yeah. All right. How are weights initialized? Weights are randomly initialized. If the weights are initialized here, then probably one step, one step, one step, you're going to come down to the minima. If the error surface is such a smooth surface, if your weights are initialized here, then what do you do? You update the weights and the loss function will be minimized. Again, update the weights, again minimized. Again, update the weights, again minimized. Update, minimize. Update, minimize. And ultimately, you reach the minima. Okay, so again, say so this is your <clears throat> weight after one iteration, your loss value will reduce. Again, you update the weights. Again, you update the weights and your loss value again will minimize. Again, you update the weights, again it minimizes. And the moment it reaches the minima, it will stop. This is learning rate. That means by what step do you want to reduce? By what step do you want to reduce? If you take a value which is very big, it might also go there and land there. If you take a very small value, it will only be here. So it will take many steps to reach the minimum. And this is also called as eta value, which ranges from 0 to 1. And If your weights are initialized here randomly, you get to this. If your weights are slightly initialized in a different place, you'll go to a different one. Hence, you need to multiple times run the algorithm with multiple initializations. And the hope is that you're going to get to the better minima, better minimum loss. Now, I think this explanation might need some time. Okay. So, let me do one thing. Let's take a break, friends, and then let me explain this part. Otherwise, it'll be very, very taxing because it's very theoretical, right? So, it is 12.30. 